We start with an unprecedented moment for women in America. The Supreme Court of the United States has ruled to overturn Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood v. Casey and to eliminate the constitutional right to an abortion. The case before the court was Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, Mississippi's last remaining abortion clinic. In a 6-3 ruling released on Friday, the high court held, quote, the Constitution does not confer a right to abortion, Roe and Casey are overruled, and the authority to regulate abortion is returned to the people and their elected representatives. In response, the court's liberal justices, Justices Sonia Sotomayor, Stephen Breyer, and Elegan Kagan, wrote, quote, with sorrow for this court, but more for the many millions of American women who've today lost a fundamental constitutional protection, we dissent. Speaking from the White House on Friday, President Biden said that Roe is on the ballot this November. The only way we can secure a woman's right to choose in the balance that existed is for Congress to restore the protections of Roe v. Wade as federal law. No executive action from the president can do that. And if Congress, as it appears, lacks the vote to vote to do that now, voters need to make their voices heard. Joining me now is Joyce Vance. She's an MSNBC legal analyst, a former United States attorney, and currently a professor at the University of Alabama's School of Law. Joyce, I know that this decision just came out. It's got a lot of written heft to it. I'm still getting through to all of it, but I do want to know what your initial top-line impressions are of the Dobbs decision. So we've seen this decision already. We've read most of it when it was leaked in its draft form, and it hasn't changed to a great extent. This is still the full-on reversal of Roe versus Wade that we had been expecting and perhaps dreading. Roe versus Wade is reversed. The Constitution, is, as you read from the opinion, does not guarantee women a right to an abortion. And the, the decisions about women's lives are returned to state legislatures. And, Katie, that seems to be the ultimate rub for American women, because in many states we have highly gerrymandered legislatures, legislatures that are far more conservative than the population, even in deep red states. And what that means is that those states will criminalize abortion. They will put complete restrictions on it, including no abortion availability in cases like incest, rape, the life of the mother, or when women are trafficked and become pregnant as a result. And so we're pushed to extremes in this country. Women are left to the whims of their states and the federal government, the Constitution, which has provided so many important protections in cases involving race and nationality. Uh, and sex and gender will provide no protection to women following this decision. Joyce, women have basically been relegated to being second-class citizens as a result of the Dobbs decision today. But let's talk about the fact that now it's up to the states in their individual capacities to be able to decide what happens within their borders. I anticipate a level of legal chaos we have not seen in a very long time. Do you agree? Yeah, that's exactly right, Katie. It, it will be chaos because different states will have different rules. So there will be a patchwork quilt uh, of laws nationwide. And there, there will be differential enforcement within the states. For instance, some district attorneys may prosecute women for criminal offenses for obtaining abortion. Others might decide that they have more important priorities to prosecute. And all of this confusion creates uncertainty. And with uncertainty, comes the difficulty and the pushdown uh, uh, on women continuing to obtain access to services that may be legal in some states or partially legal in some states, because that uncertainty will breed fear and confusion. And that, of course, is an opponent to exercise of rights. So, Joyce, you know, this opinion, again, I know it's a little bit hefty, but you're right. We have seen a very kind of similar iteration of it when it was leaked earlier. I really want to focus on this language from the majority opinion. The Constitution makes no express reference to a right to obtain an abortion. 
but several constitutional provisions have been offered as potential homes for an implicit constitutional right. So, Joyce, this idea that the Constitution of the United States fails to literally include the word abortion seems to be the linchpin for the majority to be able to say, you know what, there's all this improper stare decisis, there's all this improper analysis that got us to where we are today. So we're going to shrug our shoulders and we're going to say we're going to correct those wrongs. Is that basically what the majority is telling the United States? Because I think it's important, Joyce, because we're going to talk about Justice Thomas's concurrence in a minute. But it seems to be a slippery slope that is about to open the door to a lot of privacy rights that are going to be destroyed. Well, let's be clear about what the court is saying. The court is saying it's great to be a textualist. It's great to be a conservative textualist because you can literally twist the Constitution into any result you want to serve up to the American people. Ironically, the majority accuses the dissent of wanting to do that, of wanting to find rights where none exist. But this notion that rights have to be written, you know, specifically into the Constitution in order to exist is a real head scratcher. We have a lot of rights that aren't explicitly laid out in the Constitution, for instance, the right to vote. And this notion that the Constitution, which didn't really deal with women as full partners, right, there is no word she in the Constitution. The notion that we are limited to that as a nation is such a profoundly dark vision of this country and the promise of the Constitution and our laws. Uh, but this is where the conservative majority is headed. And as you accurately point out, if the right to abortion falls, there are other rights that are vulnerable, too. And Joyce, that opens the door for the next conversation I want to have with you. I want to get your take on Justice Clarence Thomas's concurring opinion. Within it, he writes, quote, for that reason, in future cases, we should reconsider, reconsider excuse me, all of this court's substantive due process precedents, including Griswold, Lawrence, and Obergefell. That's same-sex marriage. That's contraception. Is Justice Thomas basically opening the door for those rights to be overturned? Here's the good news about Justice Thomas's concurrence. No one joined with him in filing <laughs> this. This means that at least for now, this is only his view. I think we should still take it seriously. He was an early, you know, lone on the fringe view on reversing Roe, and today that's the law of the land. So we should pay attention to this concurrence. He's very specific when he talks about rights that are vulnerable, birth control and same-sex marriage. But there is a whole logical extension of this, and it's really a frightening development. I'm glad right now it's, it's just a one-justice concurrence. Well, you know, he may be the one justice, but I invite everybody to read this concurrence. It's actually only seven pages, and he actually says, in future cases, like I just read, we're going to reconsider all of those substantive due process precedents. I mean, Joyce, interestingly, he didn't include Loving versus Virginia which is the interracial marriage decision that came out of SCOTUS, which I think would be very personal to Justice Thomas. But, you know, what? I'm going to move on. I want to play what House Speaker Pelosi had to say after the Dobbs ruling was released. Let's take a listen. Because of Donald Trump, Mitch McConnell, and the Republican Party, their supermajority in the Supreme Court, American women today have less freedom than their mothers. You know... Joyce, there was this attempt, maybe, to codify Roe that failed in the Senate after Democratic Senator Joe Manchin did not back his fellow Democrats on this. Have Democrats in Congress, not to mention the president, frankly, have they really exhausted all of their options here to protect federal abortion rights? Nancy Pelosi said there is a threat that there might be a nationwide abortion ban move made by Republicans. It's important here for people who believe in full rights for women, in abortion rights. And that, Katie, is, as you and I both know, is not just Democrats. There's an mm -hmm. overwhelming level of support in this country for some kind of abortion rights. And that includes many people who are Republicans. So, so what does this mean? Yes, perhaps Congress has failed by not uh, passing a, a Roe-type bill and making Roe the law of the land. But, of course, that would still be reviewed by the same <coughs> Supreme Court that ruled today in Dobbs. And they uh, could very possibly find some reason to object to legislation of that nature. What the court has done is made it very clear that these decisions are up to state legislatures. So that's where people who believe in rights for women will fight if they're smart. They'll fight this battle 
at the state legislative level, that has become very difficult in some states because of radical gerrymandering that has forced state legislatures into ultra-conservative majorities that don't necessarily represent the views of voters. That means the fight belongs to us, the voters, right? What is it that they say the most important role in a democracy is being a private citizen? And we're going to have to make sure that people who believe in rights for women are registered and they vote in extraordinary numbers and that we send a strong message to state legislatures that we will not tolerate their efforts to limit our rights and criminalize our behavior. Joyce, along that vein of being private citizens, I want you and I to take off our hats right now, your legal analyst hat, my host hat. Um, you and I have talked about this issue uh, off screen a lot. Um, we're women. We live in the United States. Um, we live in some very interesting red states, you and I, but we're also mothers. So as a mom, what do you say? What do you say to the people? I mean, you and I could legally analyze this to death all day long, right? We could talk about the wrinkles. We could talk about the constitutional challenges that perhaps are going to happen. But as a mom, what do you say to the people that are listening to you right now, trusting in your judgment, um, but also caring about what that future looks like for our daughters? I'm old enough to remember, unlike you, Katie, when Roe became the law, when abortion rights became available. And I remember the conversation in my family, my grandmother, my mom, my aunt, my older cousins. And something we need to remember how to do is to talk in our families about the importance of issues like this that have become highly politicized. Because the reality about abortion is that whether you believe abortion is appropriate or whether you believe it should never be permitted, it is still a highly personal decision. And if we believe women are full participants in society, then we should trust them to make those decisions for themselves. We shouldn't let government make those decisions. We now live in a country where you can't be forced to wear a mask, a mask to prevent people from catching a deadly disease. But women can be forced to carry a pregnancy to term, even if it results from rape or, or from incest, even if it's a pregnancy that will take the woman's life if she carries it to term. Maybe we need to have these honest conversations with our friends and our families and our daughters about how critical it is that we let women make their own decisions about their own lives and encourage this young generation, this up and coming generation, to pick up that fight and to take it to the ballot box. Joyce Vance, my friend and brilliant legal analyst, I thank you for your time. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Katie.